Hey guys and welcome back to the channel, this time bringing you this gorgeous old beige desktop PC. No Tandy this time, just your regular white label PC clone in a nice desktop format. Does need a little bit of work so it seems, but it has the turbo button, the speed indicator, the LEDs, the five and a quarter inch disk drive and the three and a half inch disk drive. All of this neatly packaged in a beautiful desktop case. Wow. Now, like I said, the case does need a little bit of cleaning because I actually got this PC in a big lot of old PCs that I still need to cover. And it's always a bit of a treasure hunt to see what's going to be inside one of these things. Now, I already saw that the video card was missing but other than that, I have no idea what I will be finding in this computer. But let's take a look at the front first. So this is a computer used by DHL, apparently. We have the key lock. We have the speed indicator, which is really nice. Power button. We have the turbo button and the reset button. There's room for a three and a half inch disk drive, but they instead opted to place it here just above the five and a quarter inch disk drive. We even have a disk inserted here. Take a look at that later. Five and a quarter inch disk drive. On the back we have the power supply, a DIN style keyboard connector, meaning Pentium or lower, some serial and parallel ports. We are missing a video card, unfortunately, but we do have a networking card. Now, with these types of computers, you never know what you're going to find in them. This can be a 286, 386, 486 or a Pentium. So let's open it up and see what we have inside. Now, first thing you see is that gorgeous ceramic 486 CPU. We also have an IBM hard drive and some expansion cards. There's a lot of dust here on the motherboard, so it could definitely do with a good cleaning. But let's start by removing the expansion cards. And here we have the networking card, your standard 16-bit ISA networking card, probably any 2000 compatible. So like I said, there was no video card included with this PC, but I do have a spare one here, 16-bit ISA Trident, a true classic. Next up is the controller card, pretty basic stuff. Allows us to hook up a disk drive, hard drive, and has some serial and parallel ports. We also have a cable attached here, which is the hard drive LED indicator, which goes to the front of the case. Now, this is one of those boards with the infamous Varta batteries, which will leak all over the place, as is the case right here. So let's pull off the motherboard from the case to see what damage the Varta battery has caused. I can already see some green corrosion here on the power connector, but that's probably going to be the least of my worries. Now on the motherboard, we also have these cables here that hook up to the front of the case, which allows us to have, you know, the reset button, the turbo button, the power LED, hard drive LED. So it's best to take a picture of those just to see how they are wired up, just in case you can't find the manual of the motherboard anymore. We're also gonna be removing the hard drive, of course, which is mounted here on its side next to the bay for the three and a half inch disk drive. And another thing I'm going to be removing from this case is the front cover because that one needs a lot of cleaning both on the outside and the inside, no doubt. I mean, just look at all this dust that has accumulated on the inside. So we'll give this a proper wash also. We also need to get the drives out. So we'll start with the five and a quarter inch floppy drive and then we'll remove the three and a half inch floppy drive as well. So we've got the three and a half inch disk drive in a five and a quarter inch drive bay so that it positions nicely on top of this five and a quarter inch one. Now, as this is an old computer with an AT style power supply, we need to remove the power button as it is directly attached to the power supply unit. And here we have it, all of the components from this 486 machine. Some of these will definitely need a good cleanup. Just look at all the dust that has accumulated on this motherboard, the ribbon cables here. But yeah, that's pretty much it when it comes to the components that make up this little 486 desktop PC. So let's take a closer look. 
So here we have the motherboard with all that dust. It's virtually impossible to see what kind of CPU we have, but this is in fact a 486DX50 megahertz CPU. Here we have the Varda battery and yeah, pretty extensive damage here on the motherboard. We'll need to clean it up, uh, remove the battery and see just how big the damage is in fact. Yeah, power supply is also filled with dust. So yeah, this one will definitely need a proper cleaning also. So let's start with that. Let's remove the top cover of the power supply unit. Now I'm hoping that this one will still work, but I do want to get all of the dust out here before I start it because yeah, this is just a big mess. So yeah, inside looks pretty good component wise, but yeah, let's take it outside, get the air compressor and let's start cleaning some components. I'm also going to give the front panel a good wash, just using some soapy water to get most of the crud off. And same thing with the uh, case itself. So that usually cleans up pretty nicely. And we're back at the bench with the power supply all cleaned up. So I've got my multimeter here. First thing I'm gonna do is check if there are any shorts. The Molex connector here gives you easy access to the 5 volt and the 12 volt rails. So this is just a quick check to see if it is going to be safe to power it on. And to check the other voltage rails, you obviously need to check these AT style connectors, which expose all of the different voltage rails that this power supply supports. And there don't appear to be any shorts. As I'm going to be using this hard drive as a load, I am also going to be testing to see if the hard drive isn't causing a short. Because I have seen from time to time that some hard drives end up failing short on the, uh, the 5 volt rail. So yeah, but this one turns out fine. So we can um, check the power supply and check the hard drive in one shot. So here I've got everything hooked up. I've already pressed the power button here because I'm going to be using this switch on this extension cord because we won't really like touching that power button. We are dealing with AC uh, high voltage here. So I've got my probes hooked up to the five volt rail. I've got my hard drive hooked up. So let's power it on. And we get a clean 5.09 volts, which is excellent. The 12 volt rail is a little bit low, but we don't have anything uh, attached to that output rail. So yeah, we'll see once everything is hooked up, how it goes. But let's first check that Varda battery in more detail. As you can see, lots of corrosion built up on the motherboard here. So yeah, we'll definitely need to remove that one and see how much damage that has caused underneath the Varda battery and typically also underneath this keyboard connector. So. Let's also check the back of the motherboard. Now there doesn't appear to be a lot of damage here. So hopefully this will be uh, repairable. But first thing we're gonna do is remove the Varda battery because yeah, with these old computers, uh, that's definitely the first thing you wanna do. So I just take a flat screwdriver here so that I can apply a little bit of pressure. I heat up the pads and then yeah, normally it's just a matter of pressing down on the screwdriver and the battery should just fall out. And here we have it, the Varda battery, 3.6 volts, 60 milliamp hours, the root of all evil, which will kill the motherboard. So yeah, best that we remove that as soon as possible. I'm going to be cleaning up these holes here so that Perhaps later I'll add a coin cell battery to replace it, which is a valid replacement for these Varda batteries. But first we need to take a look at the motherboard just to see how extensive the damage is. So I'm gonna start by applying some vinegar to this uh, Q-tip and then just rubbing it over the area where we see the most uh, battery leakage. 
so that will kind of neutralize the battery uh, acid and you know if you take a closer look, look you can actually see uh, the battery acid being eaten away by this uh, vinegar giving it a more cleaner look so that we can have a better view on the actual traces that have been potentially impacted and there will be impact because on this type of damage you can almost be certain that uh, one or more traces will be cut completely the continuity will be lost and you will need to either uh, fix uh, the traces or do some patchwork on the bottom side of the motherboard and if you really want to get this 100 percent clean you'll need to do a lot of scrubbing because this thing is very difficult to get off and it also makes its way on these headers underneath ic's on connectors so it's pretty nasty stuff and when you're cleaning it with vinegar uh, sometimes it will remove parts of the silk screen so you also need to take care of that if you don't want that to happen and of course as expected when we turn on the computer with a video card attached we don't get anything on the screen now you should always attach a PC speaker to the motherboard so that you can get some audible feedback as well because sometimes you will not get anything on the screen but the computer can uh, beep some error codes. So I've pulled up the resistors here so that I can see the traces that move underneath them. And in this picture I've color coded some areas on the PCB where we should have continuity but there isn't so those are the traces that we need to focus on. So let's take a look. So between these two resistors here, we have a trace which is moving down here up to this point, but it's not going into the resistors. It is in fact moving alongside them and it goes all the way to this pin of this IC. So that's a patch we need to do. Then we have the third resistor from the right where we see a trace moving all the way here to this. I think this is a line filter. So that one needs to be fixed. And the final resistor here, we also see a trace moving all the way here to this second line filter. So that one also needs to be patched. So to recap, that's one trace going from here to here, another one going from here to here and a final one going from here to here and I actually missed another trace that I'll show you on the back of the PCB now to patch these traces I usually go to the back of the motherboard and uh, add some patch wires to the various points that I have found on the other side of the motherboard I also do a continuity test just to make sure that I have created the right connections And although I know I haven't fixed everything yet, I just wanted to see if it would turn on right now. And apparently it did. So we are making progress, but unfortunately the keyboard was not working. So I needed to continue with the patchwork. So although we fixed the two traces from the two resistors to the line filters here, we still need to patch this connection here from the IC to this point here. And I also found that this trace was broken here, so that needs to be bridged as well. So let's continue with that. So I've added an additional patch cable. I'm going to bridge these two points here and solder them on the other side. But I still had keyboard issues. So my focus went to the keyboard connector, which sometimes also causes issues when you have leaked batteries. Now, sometimes the internals of that keyboard connector might get broken. So an easy way to test that is to just use a cable that you can insert into the pins of the keyboard connector and just making sure that you have continuity to whatever is going to the uh, motherboard. So that can be easily checked with your multimeter like this because all of these points are exposed on the motherboard, obviously. But these turned out to be correct. So next thing I did was I uh, removed the keyboard connector from the motherboard, because then it's always interesting to see what's going on beneath that keyboard connector. 
because obviously there will be traces beneath that keyboard connector that you cannot really identify right now and then it becomes kind of guessing to see what's going on so best thing to do is just to remove the thing completely so that you can get a clear view of the traces beneath that keyboard connector so yeah fortunately no damage to the connector itself so it's going to be on the motherboard now with the connector out of the way we can clearly see the traces and we can do some continuity checks for example this one turns out fine this one also this is just a ground connection this one is fine but then this one appears to fail and i do believe that there is a trace here so let's take a closer look because sometimes you can hardly see the trace anymore and you need to uh, angle it a little bit towards the the light so that you can actually see the trace and there is definitely a trace between these points that has been eaten away by the battery so Let's just add some flux here so that we can attach the keyboard connector again. Solder the connector back on the motherboard. And patch that connection that we saw that was broken. And with that final fix, we were able to boot the computer and we had a working keyboard. As demonstrated here by navigating through this gorgeous Ami BIOS screens. So yeah, this is really nice. So we're definitely making progress here. Now, when you start the machine for the very first time, it only detects 640 kilobytes of RAM. I initially thought that that might be an issue with the motherboard, but it seems to be the default behavior when there is no battery attached. Also notice how it says external memory zero kilobyte on this screen. So that's definitely not normal. But when you reboot the PC and you save to the CMOS for the first time, the next thing that will pop up on a reboot is the fact that there is a memory mismatch and it does indeed count to four megabytes now. And in the standard CMOS settings, you now see that the extended memory has been set to 3,328 kilobytes, which is the correct size. So when we save that, the computer will again count to four megabytes, but we will no longer have the memory warning. And after booting, we get this familiar screen where we see the 8486 main processor. We see the four megabytes of memory. We see that we have 256 kilobyte of cache memory. We see the 50 megahertz CPU clock and the 384 kilobytes of shadow RAM. And let's take a look at the motherboard here. So a clean motherboard with the Intel 486DX 50 megahertz CPU. I love seeing these CPUs and I think the 486 is an excellent platform for retro computing. The motherboard also comes with 256 kilobytes of cache. We have the SIS chipset here, which was pretty common back in the day. We have the Ami BIOS chip, four megabytes of RAM, the AT style power connector, the five pin DIN connector for the keyboard and ample room for expansion with these six 16 bit ISA slots and one eight bit ISA slot. The power supply unit is in excellent condition and works fine. So I don't expect to see any issues with this one. And now we can finally put everything back together again. I mean, this is the nice part knowing that everything works but it's always a bit scary because you never know if it will still work after you have again assembled everything. But normally we shouldn't encounter too many issues with that. So let's just hook everything up, give some power to the motherboard, add the PC speaker, the power button. insert our IBM hard drive and this is a WDAL42 hard drive and this is actually one of the built-in uh, types that you find in these old BIOS uh, chips. So we'll just add the controller card so that we can hook up the hard drive and the disk drives. So let's go into the BIOS and configure the hard drive. So the hard drive is of type 17 which is a 40 megabyte hard drive. Let's configure the floppy drives as well. So we have a three and a half inch and a five and a quarter inch floppy drive. 
and then we can just save and see how the computer boots right now. And I love the sound that's being produced while the memory count is going on. And after the disk drive's initializing, we should hear the startup beep. And the computer should start. So it's booting from the hard drive, so that's already a good thing. Let's check to see if the floppy drives are working. So let's start with the A drive. So no issues there. I did have some issues with the B drive. I mean, the first floppy that I tried worked, but then the second all of a sudden threw me a seek error. So that was a bit of a bummer. I don't know if it was related to the disk, but I was short on time and I couldn't really investigate further. I'll also add the NE2000 16-bit uh, ISA networking card. And remember in the beginning when I showed you that the 12 volt rail was a bit on the low side. Now with everything hooked up uh, and as we start the computer, you can see that we have a clean 12 volt signal here. So that is also working fine. And if we switch it to the five volt rail, we also see a nice 5.09 volts. So yeah, I would say hardware wise, this is already a success. I love the fact that it's an Intel DX50. They're not super rare, but not all that common. We have the nice 40 megabyte IBM hard drive, which is running flawlessly. The computer had Windows 3.1 installed, so let's give that a little spin. So this is the Dutch version. Now this computer was part of a network back in the day, so I don't have the netware shell loaded here. And a lot of application seems to have been run off of the network because it's referencing an F drive here, which was probably a network attached drive. But yeah, pretty standard stuff in the Windows 3.1 environment. There wasn't all that much on the hard drive itself, no games or anything, just standard applications. There was this Rolex application here that showed a big Rolex watch, but that's pretty much the most unique stuff I found on this hard drive. So the computer was running MS-DOS version 5.0, which seems to be period correct. 40 megabyte hard drive is a bit on the low side, so most likely this was at one time a 386 that got a uh, motherboard and CPU upgrade. So let's go ahead and attach the front panel also, which is all cleaned up nicely now, and power it on. And just look at that 50 megahertz speed indicator, the LEDs, really, really nice. So yeah, I have to say I'm pretty happy with this repair. I think this machine was definitely worth saving. So the Varda battery did eat away some of the traces, but we were able to find them relatively easy. The stuff underneath the keyboard connector uh, was a little bit more difficult, but yeah, because the keyboard wasn't working, I knew that it would have to be around that area somewhere. I think the keyboard controller chip is something that rarely breaks and I didn't see any damage underneath that chip. The actual patchwork that we needed to do was also relatively simple. It's just a matter of finding the correct pins so that you can solder a patch wire on. And the result is of course that we now have a fully functioning 486 computer that will make somebody really happy. I really like the form factor of this desktop case. The fact that it has the speed indicator turbo button uh, finishes it off uh, really nicely. We have the five and a quarter inch floppy drive, the three and a half inch disk drive. Really, really nice looking desktop case as far as I'm concerned. So, that's where we will conclude on this video. I really hope you've enjoyed it. If you did, please consider liking it, commenting, subscribing to the channel. Please check out my other videos for lots of other retro computer stuff. And I hope to see you guys soon in the next video. Bye-bye. Take care.